Hi, this is Brett Lindenberg, founder of Food Empire Pro, where we interview proven food entrepreneurs so you can learn to think and take action the way they do. Today, we're going to deep dive into the topic of starting an independent coffee shop on your own terms with Brian Reynolds, co-founder of Anthem Coffee and Tea. Now, Anthem is a six-location coffee business serving the greater Tacoma area in Washington. In today's program, Reynolds outlines the actions you need to take in order to start a successful independent coffee shop brand from the ground up. This episode is more like a workshop than a typical interview. If you're searching for the first steps you need to take to open a successful coffee shop, completing the actions outlined in this training is going to ensure you're establishing the right foundation for long-term success in mind. This interview is going to cover a wide range of startup topics, including creating a business plan, how to deal with competition, how to market a local coffee shop, menu development, and what to focus on in the first year uh, planning your business. And if you're thinking about starting a coffee shop, you're just unsure about what steps to take, this program is definitely for you. Finally, if you're serious about starting a coffee shop, sign up for our coffee shop business startup kit at foodempirepro.com slash coffee. That's foodempirepro.com slash coffee. Enrollment's free and you'll get immediate access to more on-demand trainings with Brian Reynolds, a coffee shop startup calculator that is totally free to use, and you'll also get exclusive access to our coffee business Rolodex that's going to give you the resources you need to get started, like where to find roasters, paper cups, and other essential tools that you need to start up your own business. So go ahead and sign up at foodempirepro.com slash coffee to register now for free. Now, on to the interview with today's guest, Ryan Reynolds of Anthem Coffee. What is like your coffee business look like right now to give people like some background, um, like the type of operation that you have, like how many locations, you know, what's your brand name? What do you do? That sort of thing. Where are we at right now in your business? Let me take you back to where we started, man. Yeah, Maybe that'd yeah, be a yeah. better place to start as opposed to where we are right now today. Um, and, and it'll be a short and condensed version of this, but Honestly, man, we're just your average Joe's. You know, this is a family owned business. Um, and, you know, it's my wife and I, my mom and dad. And 12 years ago, when I think back, we didn't know what we didn't know. We, we didn't have, have a business plan that we wrote. Um, in fact, our whole journey was fueled by the fact that my, my parents, what they did is they actually answered the call to adopt a little five-year-old girl. So we mm -hmm. wouldn't even gotten in the coffee business had my parents not adopted a five-year-old girl. So let me <laughs> add some so context crazy. there real quick, just so you know. Yeah. And it's important because I think you know, business owners, <laughs> honestly, business owners, coffee business owners, in, in, any type of uh, entrepreneur, you have to have a why, a really strong mission that mm -hmm. drives what you do every day because – um, truthfully, business ownership is is like getting beaten down, flung around, smacked down on a football field and taking hits. I mean, it's hard. It's not for the faint of heart. So, so close to 15 years ago, my parents heard the story of this little five-year-old girl who by the age of five, she'd been through uh, 12 different foster homes, man. So if you can imagine the rejection and kind of move from spot to spot to spot, it moved on my parents' heart. And they um, – they felt compelled and they had the margin and um, and the mercy. They had the the ability to to make a difference in this little girl's life. Her name's Samantha. And so they adopted her. My dad was traveling a ton with a company called Camping World. Hmm. And he had worked yeah. for that company for 30 plus years. And so, uh, you know, as a family, we wanted my dad to be more involved and invested at home in her life. And my wife threw the idea out, hey, uh, you know, I've heard about this coffee chain. It's a local coffee chain coming up on the scene, but uh, we ought to jump into it and let's get into the coffee business. Let's start a business. And again, we're your average Joes, man. We, mm -hmm. We've never run a business. My dad's worked in the retail corporate world for all these years. Uh, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, innovative and creative very much so and very hospitable. But um, none of us are college educated. We never, you know, had experience managing people other than my dad. Mm -hmm. And so – we, we just decided to go for it. I mean, that's kind of the thing. Um, 
we didn't have money. We didn't have know how my parents ended up leveraging their house with the Mm. bank to borrow money. And that's how we started this thing. We had a, we had plenty of passion and we had plenty of drive, but, um, that, and I would not advise that. So make sure that as your listener, to me, <laughs> don't leverage your house. Yeah. Do as I uh, say, not as if, I do. Yeah, sort if, of this thing, yeah. <laughs> if this hadn't worked out, we'd be, we'd be under a bridge somewhere, just, you know, whatever, pitching a tent and figuring out life. Um, but it was kind of, it was the kind of thing that gave us that, that, that purpose, man, that there's no looking back. We're going all in. Uh, we're risking heavily to do this. Um, uh, my last name is Reynolds, and as a family, we've begun to say that Reynolds are risk takers, and we say that because uh, ultimately my parents are the ones who took a risk in adopting that little girl. Uh, the rest of the story goes like this. My folks ended up fostering eight kids, adopting four of them, so I have all these siblings <laughs> that, are, that are part of our story, which is beautiful. Yeah. The reason I share that story too, uh, Brett, is just so that the audience knows mm-hmm. uh, where our mission came from. What my parents were able to show these kids in adopting them is what we call heroic hospitality. Um, I'm going to be writing a book about that that has all of our principles from over the years, our guiding principles, mission, vision, values, and how we flesh that out in our organization to show heroic hospitality in the workplace. But what my parents have done when they bring a total stranger into their home and give them a last name and a forever home, we call that heroic hospitality, man. And so that's what our whole business has been built upon. Um, you know, we believe that when the open signs come on every day, we're hosting a party and the entire city's invited. And, um, it's our job. I mean, the least that we can do the moment people open the door is to greet them and usher them into this incredible experience, you know, where we actually truly care about the people who are visiting and we, um, invest in them. We ask them about their lives and we see how we can serve them. And, and, um, and love them, man. I mean, that's the name of the game. Coffee is just the tool that we get to use to grow the people business, right? So mm-hmm. uh, we're very cognizant of that and uh, it, we're having the time of our life now. It's what started with the franchise. Uh, we, we served our five-year franchise agreement and at the end of the five years, they wanted to double our franchise fees mm-hmm. and we're like, skip that. <laughs> you no, know, thank you. Right. And that's when we became independent and we became Anthem Coffee on 11 11- one eleven. So November 1st, 2011, launching in two locations, which here's how that worked. Our, our existing location that we had, our very first one, we flipped in a 72-hour extreme home makeover renovation type model. It was crazy. We went from <laughs> what we were to what we wanted to be in 72 hours. And we involved the community. It was awesome. We gave shirts away that said, this is my anthem so that they had this like ownership mentality and very cool. um, they helped kind of breaking stuff down and hauling stuff out. Um, So I feel like based on like everything that I'm hearing and like your mission and it being bigger than coffee, there's got to be like some sort of a message behind like the brand name Anthem (laughs) or a story or something. Yeah. What, what is it? (laughs) That's a really great question, man. Uh, There there is. And what's funny is whenever somebody asks me that question, I always go, well, what's your Anthem? You know, I flip it on the person and I, and I say, what's your passion? What's your purpose? You know, uh, for me, it's my, my faith. It's my family. It's, uh, it's the community that we get to serve. But, but what we're trying to do is invite people into the story of Anthem and go, what's your Anthem? Like we want to help you discover your anthem Uh, and our tagline is live loud. So it's like when you drink anthem coffee, you live loud, you seize the day, you go out there and kick ass and just do your thing. You know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's the the idea behind that name. And now there's a, I I don't know if you have our logo or could show that, but Mm -hmm. uh, we have a megaphone as our logo. We used to, um, you know, the local school, the high school would have what's called late arrival. So once a week, they would be able to kind of arrive late to school. And so because of that, they would all come to the local coffee shop, right? Our spot. And the line would back up. It'd be multiple, multiple, multiple people in line. And there'd be people trying to get to work, people trying to catch the train. Um, But there'd always be this one kid in his backpack, little Timmy, man. And he every time we'd call someone, Hey, what you drinking, sir? And how about you young lady in the back? And, and we get to Timmy and, and Timmy would be, you know, checked out. We couldn't get his attention. So I happened to be shopping one day and I found, um, a megaphone at Ross. Um, I don't know if you've heard of that store, but they had a oh, megaphone. Yeah. I, uh, it was nine ninety nine. I bought this little sucker battery powered. And I said, I'm going to use this the next time <laughs> little Timmy comes around, man. So, you know, the following week comes and I, I, I just took a risk with it. And, uh, 
excuse me, it's like, what, 6.30 in the morning, you know, 7 o'clock, <laughs> lines backing up and uh, I'm, I'm doing the thing. Hey, what you drinking, young lady? How about you over here, bud? What you drinking? And I get the little Timmy and I pull it out and I say, my young sir in the backpack, what you drinking? And I mean, just the fact that I pull out this megaphone in the early morning and I'm yelling <laughs> at it through it. Morning. Everybody was silent. And they, then they laughed and it like united us. Dude. It was a really <laughs> cool experience. It's like hallmark moment for us. And uh, it was awesome. Young, old, everyone in between laughing, united. And that really sealed the deal for us. We be, Anthem, it's big. It's loud. We're not your typical uh, coffee shop. I mean, what we bring to the table is is an experience. In fact, part of our mission statement says we create unique experiences that change lives. And it goes on to say, you know, there's there's more stuff that drives it. But we create unique experiences that change lives. And that's part of what drives us every single day. And experiences don't just happen by accident. You have to literally create them, do things that would be out of the norm, you know, invite people into your story. And, uh, and I think we've done a great job of that over the years. So, yeah. So you're back. So it sounds like your background's like kind of blue collar, you know what I mean? Like working or, you know, the working class, so to speak. Um, do you, I guess, like, do you feel like there's any like specific background that like, like what type of person do you feel like is meant for a coffee shop, like operating one, starting one? Wow. Great question. I, I think anybody who has a, a sincere passion to show hospitality, mm. honestly, I think if you if you got to be a people person, I mean, you're in the people business um, in this industry, people are coming in and they can I mean, in this day and age, there's coffee opportunities on every corner, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everywhere you look, there's a spot to get coffee. And what are what are we doing coffee owners to create a, a unique experience, but be something that's worth talking about and sharing with their friends and um you know, it, it, is it about us? Is it really about us as the, the coffee business or is it about us, you know, the collective, the community? And how do we draw them in? There's such a there's such a science, I believe, and, and an art to uh, no, wherever your demographic is or wherever you're graf geographically located, um, making sure that you build a coffee business, that you choose a brand um, name for your business that that really makes sense for that community if you plan to be in that community. Um, at the same token, you don't want to box yourself in by just, you know, what if I called it Evergreen Coffee? And I was in Washington, but we don't have evergreens and I, I could never go to Arizona and do an evergreen coffee company, right? Or, and I'm just, there might be that, maybe that exists out there, I don't know. But um, does that make sense? Like, mm -hmm. it's important to think those things through. And in, in choosing the name Anthem, we, we did want to be a, a brand that could, you know, be elsewhere. Mm -hmm. That could be in L.A., down in San Diego, be in New York. That, um, and I could talk forever on branding, and I'm sure we'll get to a point yeah, where we yeah, have a lot sure. of time there. But um, I, I think, um, yeah. <laughs> so I guess like figuring out how to start the business, you know, you you started with uh, a, a franchise opportunity uh, where typically they – you know, kind of give you the training, right? And how to make the coffee and how to run the business. Basically you get like the game plan for the business. Yeah. Uh, do you recommend going through something like that as a first time coffee shop owner? Like, do you think what, what you guys went through was like the ideal path or? Brett, for us, awesome question, by the way, for us, I wouldn't have done it any way different. Mm -hmm. um, in buying into this franchise in particular, I'll tell you what, there wasn't much of a game plan, to be honest with you. There was a brand recognition for our community. But the very first item that was on this sheet that they gave us that said, you know, like, here's your first thing that you do. And it was find a fireplace vendor, which made no <laughs> sense. So when I reached out to a fireplace vendor and they came to my spot, and, and granted, I'm 23 years old, never run a business. I'm acting as the general contractor um, mm -hmm. for this project. He shows up and he goes, uh, I think there's a few other things that need to be done before we get to this spot. So, right. <laughs> um, so I, I'm thankful that we had the vehicle of a franchise and kind of that uh, 
And, and that's how I would describe it. There mm. are franchises, there are those types of vehicles you can jump into and learn the business ropes and get comfortable in. Right. Um, if not that, then I would say for sure attending a coffee school, uh, hiring a coffee consultant, somebody in the coffee business that can help you fast track mm -hmm. through some of those uh, areas that the franchise provided for us. There was a nice security and support network in that deal, but we quickly outgrew the need for a franchise within about six months, I would say. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I'm not trying to be prideful or braggadocious, the, I, like, but honestly, within six months, we were actually from day one, we were the number one store in the franchise wow. for the entire five years. <laughs> and they grew, so, so we were the 10th store. They grew to 20 something stores. And then there may be three or four left today that I know of. Um, but the point is, uh, you know, we outgrew that need for that franchise and right. we, we did that just by innovating, by being true to who we were. In fact, we behaved like Anthem while we were still that franchise brand, like just the way that we were embodying the mission, the way that we were driven, the, the, the experiences we were trying to create, that was us. And that's who we are today still. So, um, I, I would definitely, I would say there's pros and cons to the franchise world. Um, but definitely don't just slap up a mom and pop thing. If you really want to do a, a great coffee business, like mm -hmm. hire somebody that understands branding, that understands the nuances of, of, uh, developing a story, you know, understanding your, why your guiding principles, all that kind of stuff, bring them in and help them fast track some of all the, the question marks. Mm -hmm. And then, um, hopefully that person or that organization, that coffee school can help you get to a point where uh, they've really helped you know who you are so that you can uh, flesh that out. Because every everybody's different. Everybody has some unique, awesome gift to bring to this world. Um, and like, yeah, that's what I'm on a mission for within, you know, we just launched Anthem Coffee School. Um, just plug that real quick. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah ah, absolutely. We'll leave that right there. Um, but but that's what we're passionate about. When I mentioned earlier, I said, look, we want to help people realize their their anthem. Like, what's your anthem? And that's not only in just the customer sense. Like when they come in, they drink anthem coffee and they go live their passion. It's like I want to help these future coffee business owners realize what what's the anthem that's inside of their heart that they want to bring to this world in the form of a cool co coffee shop concept. So, so I feel like owning a coffee shop, I'm sure there's tons of people that you like, oh, I don't I own it collection of coffee shops probably like, oh that's so cool that's so awesome that you own a coffee shop and sometimes i with a lot of things we sometimes like have this vision in our mind of like what operating a certain type of business will be um yeah. and then you kind of get into it and you're like oh crap i didn't think of this you know what i mean like i didn't realize it was going to be like this i thought uh, you know what i mean i thought i was just going to be making artisan coffee all day and everyone was going to be like high-fiving me Right. And money was just going to be <laughs> just like this. Right. Right. Exactly. So like, I guess just like from a, a, a straight up standpoint, like what is your, what does your day look like these days? Um, oh, what do you awesome. do? How many hours do you work? What, what do you spend your time doing? Well, I'll share with you what I do these days. And then I want to take you back yes. because, uh, I think there's, there's some good yeah. stuff to learn in this moment. Um, where hopefully I can drop some real value in terms of what it's like to be a coffee business owner. Mm -hmm. um, these days, my fourfold responsibility is that uh, is to protect culture, mm -hmm. cultivate leaders, cast vision, and grow daily. And I'll explain uh, those as, as quickly as I can. But you know, when it comes to um, protecting culture, like we've spent 12 years now building an incredible company culture, an incredible brand image, right? That is worth fighting for. Um, it's, it, you know, I, I believe that beliefs drive behaviors. And so that's why we have such um, resonant guiding principles and, and they're on our website once again. But you can see like all of my team, I make sure that they memorize the mission statement. That's part of the training process, like memorize the mission statement so that you can live it out. So many businesses neglect to, to do that or or utilize their mission, vision, values other than having them on a wall somewhere to look pretty like they don't know necessarily how to implement them. How do you flesh those out on a day to day basis? So when it comes to protecting the culture, we lead from the guiding principles. I'm the one who wrote them and they hold me accountable. Do you know what I'm saying? I've had to be called out 
from my own team saying, Brian, I don't know if that's an alignment with where it is that we're wanting to go as Anthem. And it's that's so important cool. to have that. No, I'm dead serious. <laughs> yeah, that's and it's cool. like, you know what? You're right. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. And so that that's how those exist. Sometimes, I mean, you have to even protect the culture from its own people, from uh, some of the other employees or people that are on your team. And sometimes you have to protect the culture of your organization your, or your coffee shop from customers, man. I'm not even kidding you. So mm-hmm. that's what some of the responsibilities in that protect culture look like because we've worked so hard to build something so rad, it's worth fighting for. Uh, protect culture, cultivate leaders. We, that's one of our core values is that we value leadership development. So um, one thing that, that we know is that our, we can't lead others where we haven't first led ourselves. So um, that forces uh, me to be better, to be coming better every single day growing. And that's part of that last one too, grow daily. Um, because we value leadership development. We always say this too, to our team, if you replace yourself, you'll always have a place. And so we get our leaders thinking about how do you replace yourself and somebody else? How do you recognize, um, some of the abilities and some of your team members that you can possibly delegate some stuff to, um, empower and entrust some things to. And so, uh, part of that cultivating leadership daily is is identifying people who are capable and have uh, have the chops, and then we build upon that. People are always asking, "Man, Brian, where'd you where do you find all these amazing people?" And honestly, we build them. I, I tell them we build these guys. They they have amazing chops and and building blocks to build upon. But we we hire fit first, and then we train all the skills and train all the anthemized stuff. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so. Protect culture, cultivate leaders, cast vision. If I'm not continuously, and and again, we're talking about what my responsibility is as CEO or owner of the coffee shop these days. Things looked a lot different in the past, I'll tell you that much. Right. And I reinvent myself over the years multiple times. But as it stands now, this third one um, of, of casting vision, if my team doesn't have a clear and compelling vision for them to latch onto, they're going to completely kind of just run rampant or disappear, or they're going to try to make up in their mind um, what it is they think I want them to do day in and day out. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. I, I heard it said recently that it's unkind to be unclear. And so part of casting vision is making sure that it's on paper, on purpose, in front of our people, um, that that they understand and know what winning looks like every day. In fact, I, I always encourage business owners to realize that their people wake up every single day wanting to win at life, and it's our job to show them what winning looks like. And so part of that is casting vision. Part of that is giving them the security or the the hope of knowing that there's something that we're building together. There's there's opportunities for you on the horizon. You know, we're going to need you to oversee this shop that we're going to birth next year. So what we need from you right now is to be growing yourself in leadership this way or this way, this way, a simple way to, to, to do that or to build your team, um, is to just have, you know, it, cause your team might just be you and one other person right now. <laughs> I'm dead serious. Right. Yeah. So you go from solopreneur to team the moment you have a second person. And what we've seen that's been super valuable is just snagging a book and every week reading a chapter, uh, you know, separately, but, but, you know, highlighting whatever stands out at you and then just sharing takeaways every week. And you get a rhythm of that. That's the simplest way to implement kind of a culture of leadership development in mm-hmm. you, it like forces you to level up and then it helps all of those around you rise. Right. Um, and then that fourth one was grow daily and, that, and that's growing sales daily. That's growing people daily. That's growing the brand awareness daily, growing your social media presence daily. That's why I like that, that kind of breakdown, uh, protect culture, cultivate leaders, cast vision and grow daily. That's what I focus on every single day right now. Those are what I keep in front of me. If I haven't accomplished those things, I'm not winning every day. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, my dad, will, my dad will call me and say, you know, hey, Bri, uh, what have you – what did you do today, bud? And it's like it would be easier to ask me what I didn't do because at, at any given time, I'm cognizant of, of growing all of these. Um, and so what I'll share with them is, hey, pops, you know, I just just moving the business forward today. Like it's not <laughs> growing. 
If we're not growing right. daily, we're dying gradually. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And I think that's a big important thing to remember. Um, like people are depending on us. Our, our communities are depending on us. As a coffee shop owner, um, they will sense. Like we'll get stale quickly if we're not continually growing ourselves and investing in those around us. So now rewind 12 years ago. Hold on. Let me answer this real quick. I'm so sorry, Brett. I was going to say yeah. – you, you, you asked a great question about how many hours does that look like now? Um, these days, it's somewhere in the 30 to you know 35 hours of, of time connecting with our team, working on the business rather than in it. Um, right. Tons of time. You're working with managers, store managers. Um, yeah. It, it, you trying know, to help them solve whatever problems are going on in the ground, that sort of thing. Yeah, we always call them pain points. And every week we're checking in on everybody's pain points. Um, I like to ask a series of questions too every week. You know, like what are you most excited about? Um, What's something you wish you could spend more time working on? You know, again, what's your greatest pain point at the moment? Um, You know, what's something uh, that you've seen that's a need for this community uh, where the coffee shop's located? Just keeping our team like really um, – And we have co-leaders over every location. So with our six locations, there's co-leaders. I like that model too, just instead of having one manager over a store, that that feeds into this idea of leadership development, right? If there's only one, then that one person is a ceiling for the growth of anybody else. They're like, oh, that person's the manager. It's like, I I will never have a shot, right? For as long as they're here. Mm -hmm. And that manager is always in a position where they're like, you know, I got to continue to excel and be awesome so that I can keep my spot. You know, it's just a different mentality. So having code leaders over each location forces them to even act as a team. There is no lone rangers out here, right? Mm. So there's little teams of leadership over every single store. And strategically over the last several years, I've worked myself out of a, a job. You know, I've to the point where I've taken the apron off. Um, and now I did that too soon at one point too. There was a time where I listened to all the feedback from my peers and my friends saying, Brian, when are you ever going to get out from behind the bar and work on your business rather than in it? And that's, right. I mean, I get it. And I love that concept. It's from the E-Myth, that book, Michael right. Gerber. Um, but I, I bought into the idea of what would be down the road and, and, and left my team high and dry when I pieced out and said, cool, yeah, I'll go work on the business rather than in it. <laughs> uh, right. And, and there was a wake of destruction, a lot of damage control, a lot of cleanup that had to happen. Uh, and I didn't realize it till about nine months later mm-hmm. when I walked into my coffee shop and realized, like, I don't like the feel. I don't like I don't like what I'm seeing here. This is it's funky. Man, I learned that day that your culture, your, your coffee shop, your company will, will become whatever you allow or whatever you make it to be. And that's where I was like, shoot, man, I'm the problem. Like, but I'm also the solution. I I got this real clear sense of purpose that day where I said, I'm going to go back in, put the apron back on, and we're going to try this again. And I said, I'm going to be present where I'm planted with this team of people. Um, investing in, depositing in, uh, teaching them the way that I want things done. And as I did that, like they, they saw that they're like, this is awesome. They began to document some of the Brianisms, you know, things that I would say, some of the anthem isms, the things that we would do as an organization that would lead to what winning looked like. And in doing that, dude, I was able to, to build back, uh, relational equity with our team and leadership credibility. Those two things are are humongous in running a business, making sure that you build relational equity through caring for your people and then leadership credibility. They, you know, they won't follow you unless they know that you're for them and with them and, and willing to serve alongside them at any given moment. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Uh, I've learned a tough lesson in the, in the years prior that, you you know, right now I don't have anybody any of our 70 plus employees, I don't have anyone that works for me. My, the mentality is that I work for them. I'm grinding, hustling behind the scenes, trying to make their jobs easier because when I make their jobs easier, my, my leaders, my leaders make the team's jobs easier. The team is able to execute and serve our customers and the, the beautiful thing keeps going around and around and around. So it's just a mentality shift. Um, uh, but yeah, when I go all the way back, dude, the, the hours I was putting in, like it was insane. 
when we launched 12 years ago, I was opening and closing for months. I, I want to say six, seven, eight months straight. And I was, and open, I was opening walking, at what time and closing at what time? Oh, like 530 in the morning and then closing at 930, 10 o'clock at night by the time wow. I got out of there. Wow. And I, I don't even remember. I think I slept through Christmas that year back in December uh, 2006. <laughs> and I was walking dead before that show even existed. Like I just <laughs> – I was – totally disengaged from my family. It was brutal. I didn't know any better though. You know, I just knew that like my parents had leveraged their house and like we had no choice but to win and make this thing successful. Uh, and gosh, I had a six month old son at the moment at at that time. And it was just like, it was nuts. It was absolute nuts. So there's a way to, um, from the get go actually create healthy boundaries from the beginning. I think people talk about work-life balance all the time. Um, so I believe, just before you, you go into that, like, yeah. I'm assuming like the first time period, it was like you were making the coffee, you were yes. like, serving the coffee, you were reading the, the customer, yeah, 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 yeah. Story, scheduling. I mean, every, everything. Right. Uh, so yeah, I would, I'd be the one sweeping the lobby. I'd be the one mm-hmm. hustling around sampling coffees out on the sidewalk to people. I'd be taking the orders and ringing things up and, and steaming milk and lattes and stirring and, and the whole deal. I did, you know, I did it everything with everyone and nobody had a clue what was going on. Yeah. It, was, it was wild. And uh, <laughs> the only thing that we all, uh, you know, were new, the only thing that we were really, really aware of and cognizant of was, was this, that, we knew we only had one chance to make a great first impression. Mm-hmm. And if, if we blew that, um, that, that's actually what I was driven by in the early days. Like I had heard one of my mentors say that, look, you only got one chance to make a great first impression. And that drove me, man, to the point where I, I was a horrible leader in the early days. I'd be chirping in our team's ears going like, how come you didn't greet that person? Why didn't you, why aren't you hustling faster? Hurry up and make that. You know, it was bad. Like right. I didn't know how to lead. It was brutal. And so, you know, um, that you can't lead like a slave driver. It's gotta, you gotta lead with purpose, mission, heart. And, and again, with clarity, if I would have expressed to the team early on, like, Hey guys, this is what I want to see happen. We need to be greeting everybody the moment they come through. Um, we need to be engaging with them at the register and then we need to hustle. And then if I was to explain the why behind all of that, um, saying, you know, this, we want to show hospitality. That's why we greet them the moment they come through the door. Right. Yeah. I'm not just register. busting your balls. Yeah. You <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the why <laughs> always drives the what? Yeah. The why drives the what? So that's something I learned quickly when a mentor came up to me and said, Brian, do you look around your team? They, they don't like you at all. <laughs> it was tough. Cause I'm like, I'm grinding 90 hours a week and like yeah. craziness. And, uh, and you're right. And I just broke down. I'm like, oh, you know. And so anyway, I'm thankful for mentors uh, in the past that have helped me get to where I've got for sure. How so. long? How long do you did you stay in that like early stage ninety hour weeks or whatever it was time period? Like, how long did that last? Do you think? You know, when my wife was about to leave me, (laughs) she said, something's got to change. When is, when's the light at the end of the tunnel? Honestly, what's crazy is that our our growth (laughs) year after year, after year, after year was steady. And so, you know, the shop was out of control. Like it was so, and what's crazy is that success can actually lead to, you know, uh, burnout or exhaustion or whatever, or or failure even. That's crazy to think that. So... I really didn't get into a great groove until probably a year um, after one year had passed, maybe halfway through, maybe 18 months. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just depends. You know, if you create a great buzz and you launch really well and you have a product that, that people continue to talk about and word of mouth spreads and more and more customers come, <laughs> um, you know, you're going to have a really successful, thriving business. Uh, what I wish I would have known then that I know now is I wish I would have set boundaries, healthy boundaries on my time. I just became, you know, I became a slave to my business. My business ran me instead of, uh, uh, you know, us as a family running it. Mm-hmm. And I would just, you know, I'd call my wife, hey, I'm so sorry. I These guys need help. It's swamped down here. I can't come home. Da, 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 you know, right. um, 
so it was a, it was a priority thing. I think it was a thing more so with me that I just didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't know that I could say, uh, you guys, how about we call somebody else in? You can, um, I'll, I'll get a third person in, fourth person in to help y'all. Um, yeah, it's just that, that's something I struggled with in my own world is is prioritizing properly. I think that's uh, I think that's pretty typical story <laughs> of like any you know small business owner uh, for sure. just for getting sure. started. Um, I guess what are some of the do you feel like obviously like you said before there's a ton of coffee shops out there they open you know they close it after a year or two um, you know probably a lot of people have the exact same story that you and your family have had uh, it just didn't you know pan out as well but you know they had the same like background uh, yeah. and they had kind of that same dream uh, what like why do you feel like some make it, some don't. Like, what are kind of like the challenges? Um, what a great question. Especially with the first, you know, opening that first coffee shop and that big risk that you basically have to take. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I've seen so many shops come and go. Mm -hmm. And I think the common denominator with every single one of them is that they just lack a really strong, clear sense of purpose. Hmm. Um. You know, it the coffee business isn't just something you just pop a machine up, get some beans, grind them properly, and sling some lattes and whatnot, like, uh, and, and expect to do well. Mm -hmm. Again, you've really got to set out the clear uh, mission and ambition um, and a game plan. You know, this is something that uh, that we're going to be teaching our students that come through Anthem Coffee School uh, how to actually build a game plan, how to think with the end in mind and, and actually start with the end in mind. Um, I think that's what a lot of uh, cafe owners, unfortunately, that fail, they have this really kind of idealistic sense of what this, you know, this thing that they've always imagined in their mind of a coffee shop that's just all, it's cute and it's fun and this little mm -hmm. corner will have the fireplace with one little couch here and, you know, the, the book corner. You know, it's like, you have to have something that's bigger and that, that will outlast you, I think. A thought process that is like, how do we – and this is the question that needs to be asked. How do we best love and serve this community that we want to open this coffee shop in? I think it's an important question to ask. And I would even go as far as to say to, to poll the people. Ask people around town. Go to other small businesses. What's a need here? Like uh, you know, the, just take some real-time assessments. Ask people, what would you like to see? If we were to do a coffee shop here, what would mean uh, be meaningful to you? What would make you want to come back day after day? Uh, you know, what's missing in this this community, and how can we add value to this community? That's some. That's a question I love to always ask. Is is and, and I do that with local businesses and with other uh, people that we collaborate with. I always ask, how can we add value to you as an anthem? How can I add value to you as as a person? Um, I think when we start with that kind of a question. We're going to be able to build something that will ask out um, kind of the status quo and, and what's been what's been <laughs> unfortunately um, too often just the case with businesses, coffee businesses shutting their doors after a year to 18 months, you know, what kind of well, like what answers do you get when you ask that question? Like, how can I add value to the community? Uh, like what? Gosh, first people are often caught off that. guard. Honestly, yeah. first people are caught off guard with a question like that. Well, that's what I was thinking. I was like, I would have no idea even how to answer that if somebody asked me. Sure. Yeah. Well, and I'm glad you bring that up. But I, I think it's, you know, and I'm asking from the perspective of like, I really care about my community. Now, and I'll ask it again, like, um, okay, as a business owner, and I might rephrase the question, <clears throat> I might ask that business owner, what's your biggest pain point right now. And then they, they will go, well, I am struggling to retain people. Right. And then I'll just add value to their life in that moment. Um, or it might be something like, gosh, it, we're just having a hard time attracting new customers here. And then I might have the opportunity. Well, let's have you come in on a Thursday. Why don't you set up a little table that you, you can share with 150 customers who come through that morning, what it is you do. And maybe if they sign up or drop a business card in something, you could do a drawing for them and give away a free $10 Anthem card or something. So 
you know, collaboration. And, and I speak a lot about collaboration these days, just about the importance of it in this day and age. I believe that businesses that collaborate with other businesses, I mean, you're seeing it all over the place. Mm-hmm. Breweries, beer, like yeah. beer breweries are, are collabing with other beer breweries. And you would think that's competition, but that's collaboration. And what it does is it gives us great jump off for, for these networks of people that may not otherwise be exposed to one brewery or another when they come together and do something special. It's amazing, man. And so we've deployed that as a strategy within our business. We do a ton of collaborations. We allow a ton of small businesses to do pop-up shops and we cool. create, co-create events with people in the various communities that we're in. And um, just last year, we we were able – not last year, actually, this summer. So we're still in, the, in 2018. Uh, we launched the Live Loud uh, Music, Coffee, and Arts Festival. Hmm. And it was a one-day wow. event, uh, tons of live music. Artists in all kinds of media, um, tons of small businesses jumped into uh, and to support it. And it was just a fun fuel day. There was a latte art competition. And I mean, we brought in the coffee community from many other cafes around. It's just it's that kind of stuff. And that's not that's probably unusual. But I'm saying these are the things that we've done that have led to our success. And this is why I want to share it with you guys. Like you have a chance to make a difference more than uh more than you have a chance to make money. But I believe that when you make a difference, you will make money. Mm-hmm. You know, when you give, when you love, when you serve, you get, it comes mm-hmm. back. And so I think that's the thing that has caused people to fail is that they haven't had that sense of let me give, 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 give before I get, you know what I mean? Before I ask or whatever. So find, find out what the needs are, meet the needs, add value. That's what I mean by that. I hope that answers that question. So basically, yeah, basically like get out in your neighborhood more, like connect with 100%. other local business owners that are in your area. Um, yeah, provide coffee start for establishing a relationships. At the right. Absolutely. Yeah, right. Just show up, be present. <clears throat> right. That's one of our, that's one of our core values as well is we know and are known by our community. We know and are known by. That means that we actually know people's names when they're coming in. And that means that people actually know us because we're out in the community. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So Yeah, that no, I think that's a cool answer because it's different than what you would ex- or at least what I would expect to hear. Like, oh, why, you know, you'd expect like a question, why do you most I'll, I'll just say most, I don't, I don't know what percentage it is, new coffee shops fail. You know, it's like, oh, mate, they don't market enough. They need to get on Facebook more. They need to, you know, da, 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 da. they got to hand out business cards or they got to like buy a billboard advertising. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like just like all these like just kind of like a hundred different reason explanation. Um, but and that's uh, what they'll do. And yeah. they'll try every avenue and everybody and their mother's coming their way going, hey, buy this magazine, buy this ad, buy right. do this thing. Right. Try to, and all of a sudden we've just gone, we've been become all things to no one and we're not making any impact. <clears throat> Still – from day from from the beginning of time, word of mouth is the greatest form of advertisement. <laughs> mm-hmm. And now, thank you know, thanks to social media, it that is just a megaphone, if you will, um, to amplify it. But word of mouth is everything, man. That's what we've banked upon for for marketing and for advertisement. Right. Um, yeah. No, that's you brought up such a good point. I'm glad you asked yeah, the I mean, especially within a small community, that makes sense. You're not, you know, you're not immediately yes. launching this like Fortune 500 brand where you need to be across exactly. the, you know, what I mean? just a little, just your little like niche area. That's all that you need. Build community, right. man. Right. Build, just build. That's actually what coffee shops are. We are, uh, and we've been called the living room. Like, mm-hmm. hey. Like mm-hmm. Anthem is the living room of That's the community. Cool. You know what I mean? Right. It's like where we just come and everybody's there. It's like, what's up, Frank? Hey, I see you over there, Ted. Like everyone yeah. is just – that's where you go. That's, that's what cool. you do. Um, and it didn't happen by accident, but it mm-hmm. happened because we went out there and we were making uh, connections and shaking hands and, and getting to know people. And then they, they're like, oh, yeah. Every time they thought coffee, they thought Anthem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, right. so important. As like an independent coffee owner, like how do you view like Starbucks and all these big chains? Like, do you view them as competition? Do you not view them as competition? I love this question so much, dude. I feel like you're yeah. setting like little T's on your balls on a T <laughs> yeah, and I'm just like, good. man, like good, good. I love this. I love this because yeah. first, I'm thankful that Starbucks paved a way for us. I mean, goodness sakes. Right. Yeah. If anyone's in the coffee industry, um, you know – 
Starbucks has created an, an opportunity for independent coffee houses to come and like innovate and, and reinvent the experience. And um, like we wouldn't be able to have this conversation had Starbucks not done that, right? I mean, they made it massively yeah. popular. They dumped yeah. millions and billions yeah. of dollars into marketing yeah. and understanding the needs of consumers in America. So I'm thankful for all of that. And in fact, I got to tell you, not one store, two stores, three, you know what, four of our six stores are literally a stone's throw away. And, and I'm not kidding, less than 100 they yards away from Washington, a Starbucks. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> less than 100 yards yeah. away from a Starbucks. Right. And uh, I live in Southern California, so you can't go 100 yards without <laughs> yeah. seeing another see Starbucks here. Yeah. Everywhere. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but that being said, you know, Starbucks pertains. They they have a specific loyal customer. Like you know what you're going to get when you walk mm -hmm. into a Starbucks, just like you know what you're going to get when you walk into a McDonald's or into whatever. You just know, right? Right. And so what we've been able to do is is when as people are thinking of coffee in whatever area that is, uh, we create a different experience for people that um, that hopefully they they love and they want to return to again and again and again. And so I, I don't view – I'm not in competition with Starbucks. Um, I'm in competition with myself and with our, our organization every day, always asking the question, how do we get better? And that, that's been our mantra. You know, I mentioned earlier in this that we grew four stores in the last six, six years. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Forgive me. We grew four stores in the last eight months, but for six years, we had only two stores. And during that time frame when we only had two stores going – uh, and, and I forgot to mention when we became Anthem, we were underfunded, under-resourced, understaffed. I mean, it was a, a junk show when we flipped from the franchise to our new brand. Mm -hmm. uh, and for that entire six years, we focused on just becoming better. That was our mantra, better before bigger, better before yeah. bigger. Right. As we got better in our systems, better in our processes, better as owners and leaders, better uh, in, in, in hospitality, uh, what we believed – was that as we get better, our customers will demand that we get bigger. And so that was our focus. Mm -hmm. And so that's what our focus is still today. We're in competition with ourselves. We're trying to outdo what we did yesterday, you know? Um, and I think that helps us keep a healthy perspective. You know, we're, we're aware of, of other coffee businesses, of, of what other people are doing, but I don't try to compete necessarily with what they have to offer at any given moment. Mm -hmm. I always just, you know, we operate from our mission, from our core values. Um, and we ask ourselves, how can we create unique experiences for people? How can we show heroic hospitality? How can we elevate our, our food and our uh, espresso preparation, our, our beverage preparation? And, you know, I don't know if I mentioned this yet, but we, we serve beer and wine. We serve coffee and tea. We we do flatbread pizzas that we make in house, and we serve mm -hmm. great sandwiches, salads. I mean, we even have anthem fries. They're these little skinny fries that are tossed in rosemary, garlic, and olive oil, and they're phenomenal. Yeah. They're freaking delicious, man. So you know, um, we constantly are looking internally. Yeah, how uh, do we, how, how do we get better? Yeah. So looking at internally, I guess did you? I'm assuming you didn't think that you'd be like adding a menu to the coffee shop when you started out or like a large, no. like obviously like probably bakery items like muffins and, you know, like, yeah, of course uh, you had the staples house. in the early right. days and when we were part of a franchise. That's kind of what was the, <laughs> sure. the norm. Yeah. But you know, we realized a very, um, a very simple thing. We're paying for our space all day long. Mm -hmm. We might as well use it. <laughs> that right. was kind of our thought process. Like, what if, so what if we brought, you know, cause at six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night, like it'd be great to have a, a beer or have a pint with somebody in this awesome coffee house setting. Yeah, it'd be great totally, to have a solid absolutely. glass of wine, right? Yeah. But in bringing the beer and wine to the equation, now check this out. A lot of coffee shops as a last ditch effort before they're failing will go, Hey, we're now serving beer and wine. Come see us. But that's, that's that white flag, like that last call <laughs> for help. Yeah. Uh, for us, it was like, no, we just want to max, you know, one of our, another one of our values is that we want to minimize waste and maximize profit. I, I mean, profit's a good thing. That's why you get, start a business. Mm -hmm. So minimizing waste uh, meant that 
You know, we don't want to waste those hours that we're open and paying payroll. We got people there. Let's bring beer and wine in and let's do it really cool. Let's, let's partner with local breweries and craft and just elevate that, that awareness of yeah. the craft brew industry. Well, that forced us to have to elevate our food game to complement the beer and wine, right? Which then now all of a sudden we have these – the selection of flatbread pizzas that we're doing. Um, you know, things like uh, the one we launched that went gangbusters was the pear bacon feta with balsamic reduction. <laughs> so simple. We hit it with the olive oil on the flatbread and then it's it's fresh pear sliced up, bacon. Of course, who doesn't love bacon? Right. Yeah, I can't grow And, right. and the pear um, – the feta, it all works together so beautifully, man, with the balsamic reduction at the end. And it's like all of a sudden people's minds are being blown. In fact, we won a, like a, we won a, uh, a, a food award during a restaurant crawl during restaurant week in our city against mm. other restaurants that were participating. <laughs> people just were raving about this little – Treat and yeah. you could do you could be creative and innovative with toast, with waffles, sure. with I mean all kinds of offerings, crepes. I mean, shoot, you know, sky's the limit. It's just I think when you're thinking food, uh, I know we're shifting gears, or I'm just kind of <laughs> ramping on this food thing for a yeah, minute. Yeah. But when you're thinking of that, what would a what does your community desire? You know, what what, are, what is the needs that you need to meet there from a actual physical standpoint, food wise and stuff. Uh, and then what are you super passionate about preparing? Like you, we didn't hire a chef to come in and innovate the menu. Uh, I just watched a ton of food channel and got inspired and started messing around with some ingredients and got some other ideas and input from our team. And we whipped some really cool stuff up. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we were excited about it and we could sell it and people ate it and uh, it was awesome. So that's cool. Um, and I, yeah, I think with the, like the beer wine thing too. Like you got to have the right vibe of a place if yeah. you're going to pull that off anyway. So like, it, yeah, you just have to like have the right feel. I feel it's like it's not for every yeah. coffee shop out there, but it's definitely, mm -hmm. uh, I would say there's a, a trend now more so than ever. And even bringing some of the, you know, uh, spirits into the game and, uh, mm -hmm. the, you know, just helping to elevate the craft cocktail deal. You're seeing it more and more and more as a trend now. Yep. And I think they can work really incredibly well together. What's awesome is that it has the feel of a coffee house that you always want to be in without – and you can enjoy a pint in your favorite place without it feeling like a bar or even a restaurant setting. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Where you could have the laptop up and you're working while you're sipping a delicious pint and right. eating an awesome little sandwich or flatbread pizza or the anthem fries. You know, So I think there's a place for it if it's well executed and, and part of your mission, part of what you want to accomplish, you know? So, uh, I guess going to like, uh, getting started, getting started with your first coffee shop, you mentioned, um, like, I know you guys got started with a franchise, so they've got kind of the, the roadmap for you. Uh, but you recommend like putting together, I know you called it a game plan. Yeah. Uh, I like game plan. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, I like plan. that too. I like, yeah, you know, yeah. It's but, whatever uh, you – yeah, keep going. I'm sorry. No, no, no. no. Um, like what kind of planning do you recommend when, like, when you're starting out? Well, like I said, and, and I, this might sound redundant, but you have to start with why. You have to have guiding principles in place and a lot of times your guiding principles are who you are. They're just a series of um, beliefs that you have and behaviors, behaviors that you demonstrate – um, that you can actually articulate and get on paper and on purpose. And from that, that's what should drive kind of all your um, decision making for for where your location should be. Uh, sorry, my kids are starting to come <laughs> yeah, to you to make it super authentic. It's so across. Fun. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Guys, I'm, re I'm actually – we're recording. No, no, no. It's totally so, fine. It's totally okay. fine. It's just like kind of funny. That's all. That's awesome. <laughs> They'll start doing dances behind us. Can you shut the door, boss? <laughs> High fives, kids. Bam. Got him. All right. <laughs> What's up, dudes? Okay. Say hi to Brett. <laughs> hi. Hi. That's awesome. High awesome. Fives. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, man. Um, but yeah, in developing the game plan or your business plan, you have to start there. And in fact, here's what's fun, Brett. I was just on um, S SBA.gov, mm -hmm. government website, small business administrative deal, right? And there's a little thing you can click the link. You can you basically design your business plan. They have all these prompting questions that they ask you. It's awesome. And I'm like, you know, because I get asked that all the time. How do you 
write a business plan. And like I told you at the beginning of the deal with my parents leveraging our home, we never had to go through the discipline of writing a business plan to submit to a bank or to submit to investors or whatever. And so thankfully SBA.gov has prepared that way for us. But even one of the questions they ask is what's your mission statement? I'm going like, yes, that's awesome. I'm glad they asked that because it's vitally important. So starting from there, um, and then developing your brand name around that. Again, it's it's what's important to you as a person because who you are comes to work with you. Mm-hmm. Your business will literally be a reflection of of your values and your beliefs and, and your behaviors. You know. Uh, so I'm so, sure you've gotten this question before, Brad. Yeah, is, sure. How, how how do I find my why? I don't I don't know how to find my why. What is like? How, where am I going to look for for my why? Like, what should my why be? Tell me what my why is. It's in a book <laughs> on your shelf in your you know no. That's a great question, Brett. The deal is, is it's, it's what makes you tick? Like, what is it that makes you come alive? When you jump out of bed, what do you want to go conquer? What do you want to do? Like what, 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 what fuels you? What's your passion? I think, I mean, if you can't articulate that, I don't think you should be able to actually run a business. I mean, and maybe that's super harsh, but I'm saying, um, that's where you, if you want to run a business, that's where you need to begin is figure out what you're passionate about. And I always tell people wherever your passions align with what you're good at, like this little area, like that's your sweet spot. Mm-hmm. So whatever you're good at and where your passions align, go all in on that. Um, mm-hmm. otherwise I think you'll be spinning your wheels, scratching your head going, what have I gotten myself into otherwise? So it, 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 there's a there's a a sense of self awareness that somebody needs to have as a business owner, um, and the ability to self assess and ask questions of yourself, like why am I getting into this? Uh, what is it that drives me? What excites me? And there's a discovery that happens. And I spend a lot of time with business owners asking these prompting questions, um, and I'd be happy to share that list with you of the questions that that kind of prompt that self discovery. But sometimes that's what it takes to, to get somebody to go, oh, I didn't even realize that that's what I was passionate about until I answered this. But now I'm starting to see this common thread in these questions I'm answering. Uh, and that's it's one of the assessment tools we use um, within Anthem Coffee School to to help better understand where a business owner is coming from and where they're hoping to get to. So what are just like one or two of these questions that you'll ask folks? Great question. Let me uh Let me just pull this up real quick so I can hit you real nice with it. There's about 10 of these these bad boys. And so it starts with this. I I like to have people list out 10 words that come to mind when they think about their business or their organization. What's just 10 words that pop in your mind right away? The second question I ask, what are five nice things that other people have said about you or your business or your organization? And so I think when you reflect on that, that also helps to kind of, you know, weave a thread through that we can recognize and pull out some things that are uh, that kind of reinforce how you're wired or, or what you as a because I think every person is a brand uh, kind. I mean, and maybe I'm weird thinking that, but like you have your own flavor, you have your own style, you have your own likes and dislikes that you bring to the table. Then the third question I ask is, what does winning look like to you mm. on a day to day basis? And so for everybody, that looks different. Winning looks different to everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, another right. question, what's your, what's your unique value proposition uh, to the people you're trying to reach and to future team members? So like I'm asking questions about what do you have to offer to the people you would possibly employ someday? And then I jump into what are the non-negotiable values that will guide you and your team or future team toward your preferred future? in a fundamental way. And that's a big question, but I ask people just to think about what's your preferred future? What's the thing that, I mean, can you think a year down the road, three years down the road, five years down the road, when you wake up, what would you like to be doing? What's your preferred future look like? And then let's re-engineer or reverse engineer that to where we start today in order to aim towards that preferred future. You know, then I ask the question, what are the behaviors and mindsets that have led to your success so far? You know, and maybe you don't own a coffee shop 
yet, but maybe you've experienced success as an employee somewhere, or maybe you have just experienced success in your life when, you know, so I'm asking those questions. Mm -hmm. So I keep going, man. I got three more questions here. Yeah, sure. Yeah, 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 sure. No, this is good. Um, yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead with those. And then I'll ask my next question. I guess. (laughs) What drives you? I mean, and, and I'll fast forward. Like I literally ask what drives you? And then, you know, what's the one thing that if you do this every day, it would, it would really best represent who you are and what you have to bring to the community that you're going to serve. And then we ask, what do you, what do you want your company or organization to be known for? You know, we kind of throw a, a legacy question out mm-hmm. there. Then I end the whole thing with what are the 10 biggest pain points you're facing right now? And 10 might seem insurmountable, but I, a lot of times that gives me insight as I work with and coach um, other business owners, you know. I'm able to kind of see all these things, connect the dots and then help draw the, you know, draw the best of who they are out of them and get it in front of them. So I can go, dude, this is what it sounds like. This is, this is your, this is your why, this is your mission. This is your purpose, you know? So it's a process, man. Yeah. I, that, that's the thing. Like I'm listening to these questions and I'm just thinking like, you're going to have to, probably the typical person is going to have to do a little bit of soul searching. Uh, that's fine. Uh, like the typical person, I feel like, like me, me too, even like, I, like I would have to be like, dang, like I've, I've like seriously got to sit down and like, think about some of these things. Um, Brett, I, I think it'd be awesome for you to do that, man. Like I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll, send, you a link with, I'll send you a link with those yeah. questions just so you can fill it out. And it's like, I'm telling you, you have self-awareness. You have, we have to kind of. One thing I encourage people to do too is is 16personalities.com. It's a free um, a, a, a set personality assessment tool out there. And when you do complete that test, you're able to see what your strengths are and what your weak, weaknesses are right away. What's cool is you kind of – you see like, oh, I'm like, I'm like Denzel Washington or I'm, I'm like you know Abraham Lincoln or I have qualities like these people. And it kind of gives you this little <laughs> boost like, oh, this yeah. is cool. And so – I always encourage people be aware of your weaknesses, but go all in on your strengths. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and in that process, you're kind of it's it's self discovery, man. I think yeah, I think it'd be important for you and for the audience too. Just jump into that, check that out, and I'd I'd love to help you kind of navigate those waters. It's you know sometimes it's a scary place to go internal and go, <laughs> who am I? Yeah, Why yeah. am I? What am I doing here? You know, but it's it's a crucial question. It really mm-hmm. is. Okay. So one of those questions in particular that I thought was awesome. I mean, they're all really good questions. Um, and they all take time to like, think about, but even like, yeah, what does winning look like? Right. Cause like winning is a one coffee shop and you're like the owner operator and you're, you know what I mean? You're, you don't have your, you don't have a boss, you're doing it. You know, you kind of like have that one spot that is like, and that's your vision and that's all you want to do. And you just want to be self-sufficient. And then success is also Starbucks or caribou coffee with yeah. you know, tons of locations. Um, I, I think that's, I think that's a really important question to know too. Um, and, and maybe even on top of that, like not just that look, but like in income winning, like, you know what I mean? Do you need $100,000? Do you need $50,000? Do you need a quarter million dollars of like bottom line revenue? You know what I mean? Like it's going to be way different well, what you're going to have to do to like hit each one of those. Just need, you know, you just want 50000 You know, yeah, be a sole operator. That's it. Just do that. <laughs> you're done. Yeah, it's like, like in a coffee truck it, or yeah. What's funny is that, you know – Winning, first of all, winning totally looks different to everybody. And somebody who might leave a job to to do a coffee business, um, you know, what what salary are they leaving behind? Let's just say, mm-hmm. hey, they're they're leaving behind. Let's say fifty grand. They're leaving, and so it would be winning for them to come and earn, you know, fifty grand out of the gate. Okay. Right. Well, then if that's the case, then we need to reverse engineer that to go. Here's the numbers that you'll need to hit. If we work the way backwards so that the net profit ends up being 50 grand or let's ask the question like, are you going to be an owner operator, which in case I was. And so I made sure that we allocated and built in. Uh, this is what my salary will be. This is what I would like to make each uh, each month or every two weeks, whatever. Right. Every month, every year, whatever. And then, you know, if there is profit at the end of the day, um, then maybe that will supplement for some of it. 
So mm-hmm. it's just everybody's going to be different. But I think it's one of the most important questions to ask is how much how, how much do I want to make? And then identify that. Write that number down. Because if you don't do that, the problem is, is that you'll end up building a business that uh, relies on you not taking a salary or you not fairly compensating yourself. And you will end up hating the business that you opened mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. sacrificed a lot of things for. And that's where a lot of business owners get into trouble, too, is they just don't think that part through very well. They just think, dude, once our business is profitable, um, we'll begin to you know, take a draw or take money from it. Um, I'm going to mess up the guy's last name, um, but it's the author of a book called Profit First. And I think it's Hmm. such an incredible concept. Uh, I'm I'm studying that book right now. I'm trying to Hmm. learn that method. Oh, it's ridiculous. Mike, Hmm. I I botched his last name. It's a really cool last name, Mike Milanovsky or something like that. Hmm. Um, Sorry, sorry, Mike, if you ever watch this. But um, check that book out. The principles in that are phenomenal. And what it does is it kind of, it it starts, it starts, Profit first. It's saying, it's saying, build your business in such a way that you have uh, profit that you are cognizant and aware of that you want to attain to. Pay yourself first. That kind of stuff. Set up a an owner's compensation, and and that way you never get to the point where you're you've built a business that literally owns you and you don't get any reward from. Do you know what I mean? Right. So, I would encourage readers to check that book out for sure. I I can't honestly go like speak into it super um articulately uh finances has been an area in my life it's one of my weaker areas you know uh financial management but it's an area that i'm i'm starting to focus on growing now mm-hmm. i'm but i've gone all in on my strengths where i know that i'm uh strongest at that's where i've gone all in so again this we're, we're trying to answer the question about winning and um i think People have to, we have to ask ourselves that. What does winning look like to me? Does it look like I only work 15 hours a week and I get to make breakfasts with my kids in the morning, see them off to school, be home, you know, after school for them? Like if if that's what winning looks like, then we need to design a plan around that. Mm. We need to set boundaries in place that allow me to be at home for breakfasts, um, take the kids to school, go grind, 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 grind. And then pick them up from school and be present, plugged in and at home. And sometimes that forces us too to realize, you know what? Um, I need to delegate the bookkeeping aspect of things to people. I might need to delegate some other things to my team, like inventory and ordering or um, employee uh, management when it comes to scheduling and things like that. It, don't take that like, don't take that home with you. Uh, I'm guilty of that. I mean. That's what I've done for many, many, many years. And um, I was just talking with my wife the other day saying, look, I'm trying to, to reframe a new work week, like my ideal work week, something that cool. uh, yeah. is my preferred future, right? Yeah. I mentioned that earlier. Um, and that's how I'm going to approach 2019. We, we've done a lot this year. It's been a heavy year, four new stores and a coffee school. It's like, right. That's yeah, enough yeah, for yeah. what? <laughs> yeah. You know? So I don't know if that if that answers the question adequately, but but winning looks different to everyone, and I think it's mm-hmm. important that we know that going into it. What does winning look like for me? I think you've kind of kind of touched on it before, but I just want to like hit this one head on because I feel like it's something that not not just necessarily coffee businesses, but like other small businesses. Like, um, hey, I'm going to buy a coffee business. I'm going to hire a manager, and then. Like, you know what I mean? I worked corporate America my entire life. I got my nest egg. Now I'm going to buy the business, but I'm going to hire somebody else to do it. I'm just going to have like that residual income or I'm just going to take the cash flow off. Do you think that like works? Do you feel like you've got to be in there at least in the early days? You have to set the tone from Mm -hmm. from the get-go. Absent ownership doesn't work. I believe that, uh, you know, now now, let once you establish again the foundation the foundational principles of the business of the organization you can't just hire a great manager and go hey have fun do the thing make me money and i'll just (laughs) enjoy it it doesn't work like that you have to be plugged in present proactive engaged in um you know and first of all how could you even know who to hire right if if you didn't uh, know what your what winning looks like what your mission vision values are like how would you have any you can't just – you know what I mean? Mm. I, I mentioned earlier yeah. you we hire fit first and then we train all the skills necessary to grow. And so absent owners, 
it, it doesn't work very well. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Yeah. What works is working yourself out of a job. You know, mm-hmm. take take that nest egg, take that money, the corporate America guy, and 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 find somebody that you can instill this really incredible vision of what you want to build, and invite them into the process, involve them. The, one of these awesome principles that I've I've lived my life by is involvement equals ownership. And so, if you could find somebody that you can involve. Just mm-hmm. involvement alone, it, it translates like to this that. ownership mentality that people, people will they'll work harder, they'll work, um, they'll become more loyal, um, it, and it doesn't even start stop there. It's it's involvement and investment. So investment of time, investment of yes resources financially, but also tools to help grow that person. Like when you invest in somebody that way, there's that equals longevity. Mm-hmm. So involvement equals ownership and investment equals longevity. They go hand in hand. And for that person that would want to start a business just by pulling cash out and kind of throwing it at it, you're just going to end up throwing more cash at it, more cash. You're throwing money at it with no right. purpose, no clear direction. It's not going to work. Um, but yeah. if you build it alongside somebody and you equip them and you empower them and you entrust responsibility and then they in turn do the same thing with the team of people that they bring in. Uh, then you can start to work yourself out of a job and enjoy the fruits of uh, that really well uh, crafted business concept. So, what do you uh, like? How do you how do you uh, document all this stuff? You just do it in you get a notepad, you put it on Google Docs. What do you recommend? <laughs> what do you recommend for people? You know, um, gosh, yeah. What so, works for you? I guess. <laughs> I sit, if I sit in front of a, uh, a computer and try to type my thoughts out, I mean, I will, I'll fall asleep or I will, I have ADD through Z. Like I, you know, the whole deal, I just can't, it's crazy sometimes. So I've had to find people that have strengths in administrative type work. Right. Mm-hmm. And I will c- cast a compelling message or vision for what it is I want to see happen. Hey, for instance, let's talk about putting together a, an employee handbook, you know, let's talk about the, all the things that need to be in there. And I'll delegate that. Like they might then go find a mentor that will help them put that together. At the end of the day, they'll bring it back to me and then I can look at it and we can go through this stuff. So when it comes to documenting processes and procedures and, um, and best practices, you know, uh, like we're continually having to innovate and, and adjust our processes and procedures just to keep up with the growing demands of our business or to mm. to streamline and make a process better. And so, yeah, we have those things documented. Um, and, and I guess just yeah. even, even in like the business planning phase when you're just kind of like starting out, like would, do you delegate Man, that too? Gosh, in the business planning phase, I would say, I mean, I remember I have notebooks. I can show you. Yeah. I've got like, here I am right here. Like notebooks for days. It's kind of what I do right. too. Yeah. And then it's like, really? uh, where's that, where's that notebook that like had yeah. all those good ideas. Yeah. <laughs> well, yep. And not just ideas. Kind of the like, thing. There's a notebook here too, that has like a hundred names that we were considering for our coffee shop, wow. you know, okay. back in the day. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, I need to find which one that was, but, uh, carried around kind of just something to keep available and jot down and whatever. And just be in the mentality comes. of constantly yeah. learning. Like in mm-hmm. asking great questions of other people and, you know, if you find – say say you you pick up dry cleaning. I'll use this example. Pick up dry cleaning but you have an incredible experience at the counter and you talk to the owner for a minute. Maybe you just say, hey, could I ever just pop by for 15 minutes and ask you a couple questions about business ownership? Totally mm-hmm. different industry mm-hmm. but we're in the we're, we're in the people business no matter what business it is. And so yeah. to ask some questions, get some of their feedback and insight, I think it – that's kind of how I've built our entire models by examining and paying attention to cool experiences that I've had at mm-hmm. restaurants or when I'm traveling and just documenting it. I'm just mm-hmm. keeping notes of it. Um, or I'll, the, the other thing that's super helpful too is as you're learning, teach. Like as new information is coming in, teach that stuff to somebody else. It fortifies Retain it. what you're learning in you and it helps other people around you. You know, So that, that's what I would say.